Hello and welcome to Brian Moore's Full Contact with The Telegraph. Well, we head into the final round of fixtures in the 2021 Six Nations and it's only Wales who can lift a Grand Slam after England p- produced an impressive performance to see off the tournament favourites France at Twickenham. Eddie Jones' side said that their best performance of the tournament so far but he reminded his critics just what his tip team is capable of when they do click into gear. Jones himself said afterwards that the side was nowhere near their best and he expects them to kick on another level when they take on Ireland at the weekend, a game we'll be discussing in detail throughout the show. As for Ireland, they head into the England game after surviving a late comeback from Scotland at Murrayfield and despite winning the game, Captain Johnny Sexton expressed concern over soft tries he said his side had conceded and he called on them to improve ahead of their final match this weekend. Defeat for France leaves Wales as the only undefeated side in the Six Nations and Wayne Pivak's side so off Italy with expected ease, but their biggest test of the competition so far will come at the weekend when they travel to Paris to take on France. So we'll be looking ahead to that one with the former Ospreys head coach, Sean Holly. As ever, we'll be discussing your questions, including the latest on the Lions tour, the future of the Six Nations following the investment from CBC Capital. And alongside me today, very pleased to say making his full contact debut is the former Ireland captain and Brees Lion, Rory Best. Hello, Rory. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm okay. First of all, can I say uh, congratulations on a magnificent career, which I watched from afar. I never got to play against you. I would like to have done. Um, it would have been an interesting battle. Um, <laughs> tell you what, uh, let's, <laughs> let's start at Twickenham. Um, what did you, you, you make of it all? I thought it was a cracking test match. It was a really, really good test match. I think both teams looked like they wanted to play. Rugby, they wanted to get to the width. There was some really good mixing up between the backs and the forwards. I think when they kicked, both teams kicked on the front foot and, and tactically, and I really enjoyed it as a spectacle. Um, I've put this theory forward. Um, people have been calling it an excuse. It's not an excuse, it's a reason. And to me, it's becoming quite plain that the... Spine of the England team, which is a Saracens base and has been for a long time. There are 365 caps with their players. Because they haven't played at all, apart from Atoji, who's a freak, um, it's taken them time to warm into the games. Now, because they're in the Championship, they couldn't have played any games before Wales anyway. And it's taken time. I just want if can you explain, because you're much more recent than me, what is the difference between, because you can be sharp and you can get, fitting camp what is the difference between that and match fitness yeah i think that there's no doubt that, that these boys can be fit and they can be physically fit and they can be primed and they can do like wrestling contact drills you can do all of these to try to replicate a game but i think what happens in a game is when you get tired when you get fatigued and, and like you know yourself Brian, as well it, it fatigues you in a very different way to any kind of training you don't know when you're going to get your break it's not work for 30 seconds have 10 second break or or whatever way around they're doing it you could go a long passage of play have a short break do another one and it's mentally you just switch a little bit because your mind and and you can't help it your mind just drifts when you get tired and you see things a split second later and when you're playing in club rugby um, in the league, you have a little bit more time. So that split second switch off isn't as big a deal. European Cup is a step up. But when you get to international rugby, it is about being mentally on all the time. And, and that ultimately is the, the difference between some of the top players and the guys that don't quite make it international level is that is that mental side of it. Because everyone's physically fit now. Everyone's reasonably physically strong, explosive, all of this. And it's that mental capacity which... You train and you're being hit from different angles. It's, everything is so unexpected and so fast-paced. And, and I think I totally agree with what you're saying. I think you take somebody like Jamie George and some of the mistakes that he made um, in the first couple of games, I haven't seen Jamie making those in years. He has been consistently one of the best performers in the world at Hooker for the last, whatever it's been, three, four, five years. Um and he just looked like somebody that, that needed a bit of match sharpness. Atoje is a wee bit different, obviously. <laughs> Can I just add, I mean, from my, from my perspective, uh, exactly what you say. In, in drills, you know, X follows by Y, follows by Z, and that happens. In games, you've no idea what comes next. You might be doing something, and then you might be have to run back 50 yards, 
you might have to support, you have to make this decision, that decision, what comes next. Uh, and and there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge difference. I think... I, I, and I think England have improved because because of that. I people have been saying about the COVID effect for for France. Well, first of all, it was their fault <laughs> to start off for breaking lockdown rules. But I said to them, "Well, I tell you what. In the first two minutes, they didn't look to be affected by COVID, and nor did they in the thirty eighth minute when they were running that sensational training ground try." Um, and I, I, to me, it was just a, a, it was just a simple effect that if you get on the wrong side of another team and they put pressure on you, you start to make mistakes. And they made more mistakes than England did in the second half, and it ceded the advantage to England. In the same way that England made more mistakes against Wales in the second half, you know, and it, and it, and it went the same way. Um, and how 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 good do you think the French side are? I think they are very good. I don't think they're anywhere near a finished product. I think even That's last a bit year, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit. I think the big question mark is around when the pressure comes on. I felt in last year's Six Nations that somebody were, was going to beat them. I thought it might have been Ireland at the end, the way it was running, but obviously the way it disjointed and then the time it came into November. But I looked at the French team and I went, we haven't really seen a team put real squeeze on them and I think England did that I think they probably responded better than they did away in Scotland in last year's Six Nations now they got a red card and all of that but I thought they looked like they could fight back against it but England at at Twickenham probably just proved a little bit much for them and I think a young side like that will learn how to cope with it better I think the big thing for France is that they've always had this problem at out half in the in the recent past. You know, it was like one in, we'll try him. What about him? Oh, that didn't quite work. We'll bring. Whereas actually, I feel now they have two young out halves that can be there for a long time that can mix up. And previously, it was mixing the sublime with the ridiculous. It's now mixing the sublime with the controlled. With okay, a couple of mistakes because they're young, but they're learning. And and I think for me. Their halfbacks and the solidity they're going to have there for the foreseeable future is going to be the, the big thing that's going to catapult France to be a very, very tough team to, to beat. Yeah. Um, what the, the, I don't think it was controversial because I thought, I thought I saw the ball down just like Joy Neville did. Um, that they told you try. Did you have any qualms about Joy Neville's decision? No, I think it was right. I, I agree with you. I think there was a there was a moment where you could see it and you could actually see it for a moment, probably from two of the angles. And I think there's a lot about the refereeing and, and some of the refereeing over the past, um, whatever number of weeks, both in the Six Nations and some of the club stuff has been questionable. And I think that's why you have good, almost inform referees as your TMO. So Joy Neville has been really flying up through the ranks as a referee and now she's in the TMO, and you can see why having strong referees in there makes a big difference, because it's not... I think the thing that frustrates me about TMOs is the referee will say something, and I have never heard a TMO yeah. say anything other yeah. than, I agree. And yeah. it's like, well, you know, what are you there for? Well, like, why have we wasted all this time? If you agree with that, you must have seen it, so just tell us. And Joy and Furnace to her went, you know what, on-field decision was no try, but... I can see it, and it's hard for you to see in the Jumbotron standing 60 feet away, but in my truck, I can see that that's a try, and I really liked it, and I think it was the right decision. Yeah, uh, Let's go on to uh, Scotland, Alan. It was a three-point win. Um, I, we were discussing last week and saying how difficult the game was uh, to predict. Um, in the end, I thought, although... It was uh, a creditable and uh, notable fight back by Scotland. I thought Ireland should have been out of sight, really. I thought they could have yeah. put the game away. Yeah, I, and at the start of the game, the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, I thought Ireland dominated, and I thought they probably should have put the game out of sight. They looked they look good, and you know, they looked physical. They probably, uh, for me, they reverted a little bit more to type, and the more the game went on, They went back to what has been the type under Joe Schmidt. You know, it was about a physical game. It was about saying to Scotland, if you don't front up, if if you don't beat us up up front, you can't can't beat us. And that was ultimately what happened. A few lapses probably made it a closer game than the like. And from an Irish point of view, 
I was delighted that Johnny was able to kick that kick, that pressure kick at the end, because I think they deserved the win. And I think for their confidence um, and Ireland as a nation and as a as a union, I think to draw that game would have been would have been very tough for them to take and probably very tough for the public to take. How do you think they're going to what in what, what frame of mind do you think they're going to the England game and uh and, and also just um uh, as a subsid subsidiary question, um Paul O'Connell's effect on the uh, all squad. I think you, you can see firstly the breakdown. It was something that he was brought in. It was something that felt Ireland had digressed a little bit from um, sort of that 2018-19 season to, to last season. And he was brought in to do that. I think their breakdown looks really strong. Now they look like they can go through phases. They don't always go over the gain line all the time, but they keep the ball. And then defensively, they put so much pressure on the opposition. Um, and then obviously the line out. The Autumn Nations Cup kind of exposed a bit more so when you know Ian Henderson wasn't playing. That there was a real reliance on him to be able to call it. And I think when you're relying on a caller, your system's probably not a hundred percent where it needs to be. Whereas now with Paul O'Connell, you see the attack. Now Hendy's played quite a bit, but when he didn't start the first game, the the lineout looked good. But defensively, the the system that they have there that obviously Paulie's been drilling is working really, really well. They have a couple of smart um, line-out jumpers in Tag Byrne, James Ryan and Ian Henderson and they move really well. But still, you've got to have a good system. You've got to be well drilled. And, and I think up front, I think Ireland are looking, looking quite strong. I think the scrum is still what was an area of real strength. I think they're just getting parity and, and I would like Ireland to be hammering on and, and really using that as a platform a bit more than they are, but there's no doubt line out and breakdown. I think Ireland are, are back looking very strong. Going going forward, I mean you, you mentioned the uh, and I hear I, I was trying not to use the word regression when I really mean um uh difficult to get the right word, but I think you're right. Um the reverting to a bit more clinical, a bit more control play through the halfbacks, uh, so very redolent of when Joe Schmidt and the very precise game he was playing. But I thought that Ireland had so, sort of said, well, look, we've gone as far as we can with that. You know, 2018 was the absolute nadir of this, and we, we, we got to the number one in the world, and that got us all, you know, a long, long way. But to go forward with the best in the world as the game is developing, we need a bit more. Now, um, I don't see anything wrong with mixing and matching the two, but do you think... It's a default mode, or do you think that that was just something they gave forced on them? I think it was a bit of both. I think the game was forced on them because there was a lot, lot riding in that game. You know, I think if Ireland had a loss to Scotland, you're probably talking about finishing fifth, um, or you're certainly talking about having to beat England and rely on things. And you're, you're, it's nearly a playoff between England and Ireland for third and fifth, and um, the way yeah. things potentially could have panned out. Um, so I think. The, the way the game went, it kind of dictated it. Murrayfield is a, is a tricky place to play, even without the crowd, in terms of just it becomes a bit niggly and it becomes a bit stop-start. And if you allow the game to break up, it suits Finn Russell and it suits Stuart Hogg and the, the looser, the better for them. Um, so I think that that dictated it. I think Ireland showed against Italy, albeit it was Italy, that, that they are looking a little bit more comfortable. I think they, Ireland, have to keep developing that game because... You're right, the modern game now is about being comfortable and that unstructured, being able to play what's in front of you, having good options, good lines, being smart enough to take those. And it's something that Ireland probably weren't great at um, before Andy Farrell took over. And it's something that he's really trying to drill into them. But at the same time, when you're playing in these pressurized games, all you want to do is when the pressure comes on, you revert to type. And you just want to go back and go, we know that this worked and ultimately yeah we want to play a bit more width but when we play Scotland if we go through the middle of them that works and that wins and, well, it's and Andy ultimately Farrell's, it is and, like it's end of Andy Farrell's second season now um, you mentioned the the break that he had to have with the Joe Schmidt era I mean what, what do you think the biggest differences are between his approach and uh, and Joe Schmidt's and how well do you think it's working I think that Andy 
wants to be a lot less structured in terms of, you know, think under Joe, like we knew where to be, you know, it was three, four, five phases, it was set. And then after that, it was about keeping the ball, applying pressure, being really good defensively, really good in the air, and just squeezing teams. Um, Andy's a lot more about, right, I want people to make decisions on the pitch, play what's in front of you. And if it's the wrong decision, and you go through that, we can live with that. But if you don't have the confidence to make that decision, you know, that for him is a, is a bit of a failure, I think. And it's taking time. And I think the, the biggest thing for me is that under Joe, everyone knew what the, what the structure and the system was. Everyone knew when you turned up to play Ireland, how they were going to play. And that was, that's fine. That was really successful. And it shows that actually being predictable, but doing it, a lot better than somebody can defend you doing it is still a good good method. The problem I have just with Ireland at the minute is that I kind of know where they're trying to go and you see glimpses of it, but I don't know that you turn up to watch Ireland play fully knowing what you're going to see. Um, and that is that is what's going to take time because you're trying to change a, a bit of a mindset and, and a bit of a culture that was there and allow people the freedom to make these choices. Um, you've played against England sides. You've beaten England sides. You've been on the the, the end of some sides, like you know, in two thousand and nineteen when England were impressive. Um, what are you know when they play well? If they bring their A game, what is it that Ireland have to do to match that? I think it's it's about physicality. Um, certainly over the last few years, and that's it's probably came from the points that I made about Joe. You know, everyone knew that if you could physically get on top of Ireland. You had a good chance of beating them. So England have brought that. Um, I think the last few years, Ireland have probably struggled to match that. And a lot of that has been the breakdown. I think if you're going to beat England, you've got to beat them at the breakdown. You've got to get that game line. You've got to get quick rock ball. And I think for Ireland to to win on Saturday, they also need, they need a way to get a foothold in the game. And I think the set piece is going to be really important for them. Can they get an area where they could almost get a break. You know, if, if England are dominating, can they bring it back to a scrum and squeeze a scrum penalty or squeeze a bit of pressure from a scrum or a mall or their line out defence? They're going to find, they're going to have to find a foothold in the game around that set piece that they can dominate. Um, and, th- and that's going to be vital because that will not just exert the physicality that the forwards will want, but it'll also exert pressure in England. The narrative up to the game will obviously focus on Ford and Farrell, both uh, characters that divide opinion starkly, um, both get a lot of stick for their irascibleness, the way they do or don't speak to referees. And yet, uh, you know, I know Owen Farrell not very well. You know uh, Johnny Sexton very well. They're not at all like, um, like, you know, they're portrayed in the media or people think about them. A lot of listeners get in touch about Ireland's options at 10. Um, what do you what do you think of both players and Sexton himself? Is he going to stay to the World Cup? Do they have a replacement? Um, I think, firstly, they're very similar uh, personalities um, in terms of they have this insatiable win to, will to win and will do anything to win and expect everyone around them to have that same mentality. And and sometimes when you see it spilling over, it's when they feel that maybe somebody else in that in that particular moment doesn't have that same will to win. And, it, and it's just, it's a desperation at times to want to be the best. And I think as a captain, as captains, they've, they've brought that into their game. And I actually think they've both done really well. Like the, if you look at how Owen Farrell dealt with the Wales game, yeah, look, the, the team could have stopped giving away a few penalties, but that the, the Gozer bit where he was trying to get them to look at the knock-on and trying to explain to them about the, the quick cross-field kick, like everyone's going, oh, he should have handled it differently. I don't know what else he can do. He's trying to explain his point. The refs heard him and has just ignored him. And like it's not like you can't just go and grab him and make him <laughs> make the ref. But something, you know, in, and I don't think that he looked like he particularly lost his temper. He was clearly infuriated, and rightly so. Um, but I think the two of them have managed to, to when they're dealing with the refs, still the body language a little bit is an issue. 
but I think it's getting so much better. I think both of them, you can see the way both teams, I think you see a lot of how a team holds a captain by the way they bounce back from tough times or losses. And both England and Ireland, after two, um, you know, the losses at the, the start of the tournament, I think both teams have bounced back. And a lot of that is down to how the players want to play for the captain, how they see him and, and how they are driving them forward. And I think you see a lot of that in them. And, and that is the most important thing because ultimately, yeah, you want your captain to be your best player, but you want your players to respond to them whenever they act or speak. And, and both players get that. And, and that is, that is vital. And yeah, look, Johnny's under, there's almost like a love hate relationship with Johnny and, and Ireland. Everyone, wants to love him but as soon as something is perceived to go slightly wrong everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon and when he plays for Leinster it's almost when he gets substituted the, the camera the producer's going to like, keep a camera on Johnny because he will give us something body language wise that we can completely throw petrol on and blow it out of all proportion and he just gets frustrated and he wants to win and I think there's a lot of attention on him and wrongly so because he's still the best 10 in Ireland by a considerable distance he wants to go on to the World Cup um, and I, see, I, I don't have a problem well, whatever old he or anyone else is if the form is there and the, obviously that brings experience as well I don't have a problem with that I just for, from, from an Ireland point of view I would be concerned if anything happened to him mid-campaign and no yeah. one you know no one was there who not tried and tested to the same degree obviously they can't be but at least, you know, sufficiently fluid with the systems and the players to people to say, right, OK, no, no panic. We know this guy can do it. You know, regrettable loss, but let's go on. Yeah, I think Ireland have been a little unlucky in that they have kind of developed understudies to Johnny and then for different reasons, they haven't been there. At Joey Carberry post-World Cup, you know, they put a lot of time into him. He got injured just before the World Cup and really probably went to the World Cup on one leg. So... They needed him there, but he wasn't the replacement that they developed because he had the injury, which subsequently took him out for uh, whatever, the, probably going on 12 months or more. And now he's back and he looks good. The problem has been a little bit in the past because Johnny had a few niggles in that sort of 1920 season. Ireland needed him to play to get his match fitness up, to get his sharpness up. So therefore you couldn't, he couldn't take him out to rest him because he didn't need to rest and he needed games. And that has a has a vicious cycle because you need him playing in form. If you have Johnny Sexton in form, you can play somebody like Italy and go, right, look, Johnny, we're going to put you on the bench as a safety net, but we're not going to start you. Yeah. But if you need Johnny to find form, those are the games when he can get a bit more of an armchair ride and find form and kick on from it. And I think Ireland probably don't have anyone that they can fully trust. There's a lot of yet. London Irish who's not doing too badly. Yeah, there is, but that is that is other problems, which we'll definitely not go into today. But I think Ireland don't don't have that at the minute playing in Ireland until Joey comes back fully fit. Um, you know, Billy Burns is is inexperienced. Ross Byrne has had his troubles, particularly against England. Harry Byrne hasn't really played in a full strength. You know, when you get to the European Cup games, he's argued behind his brother and Johnny. So to throw him in against, say, England this weekend, you know, I think that. You got to, the beauty of the R system is that you're allowed to develop and bring people through. You know, you put them in for a bit, bench them a bit. You know, and you can you have you can't just throw somebody in if he burns out. We'll throw him out and we'll bring somebody else in because there isn't the sheer numbers that maybe in England or France have. So you've got to be careful with this young talent. And and I think that is just where Ireland are sitting at the minute. They need Joey to be fully fit and match sharp so that they can take a bit of the pressure off Johnny. Because you're right. At this current time, if Johnny goes down, they are a little bit lighter. Billy Burns is playing really well for Ulster and he's tactically and his ability to pass the ball is really good. But is he able to step up to a top, top level international fly half? There's obviously a question mark there because he's not getting enough game time to develop that. And, and look, Andy being in the camp knows better than anyone. Well, Wales are heading into the final round of fixtures as the only side in contention for a Grand Slam. Now, not me saw this coming pre-tournament. I have a, a guest who has a grin as wide as a Cheshire whatever on his face. <laughs> it is Sean Holly, former Ospreys head coach. Hello, Sean. Hey, Bray, how you doing? Now then, um, 
uh, Dai Lama, who I think you follow on Twitter, <laughs> has christened it the Something House Grand Slam. We all know <laughs> <laughs> what the four letters missing are. Does it matter whether there's element of luck? Does it matter if it's so characterised? Oh, I think you guys know, but we all need a little bit of luck, don't we? And and there's some merit in what Dai Lama says in terms of uh, maybe our first couple of victories. But since then, I think we'd all probably agree this Welsh side has developed. It has got better um, and it's proven a few people wrong. And some of the statistics are backing that up now. You know, really good execution, clinical finishing in the 22, the best in the tournament, scoring tries. Uh, which was a criticism in the autumn and towards the end of Warren Gatland's tenure. And we're undefeated. So by hook or by crook, you know, you've got to give them at this stage some praise. So what has changed from, you know, Pivak's early reign when he couldn't buy a win and now when he can't to have a loss, seemingly? Well, a couple of things for me. Uh, one, the set piece has got better. Credit Jonathan Humphreys. It was poor last autumn. We couldn't win a line out. The hookers were getting blamed, but as you, you two guys know, it's a combination of things, and uh, that's got right. They've gone simple options. They're using a range of, of jumpers, but winning the ball, and the mall has got real good purchase, and they're scoring tries off it. So that's one thing. Defensively, he made a harsh decision to remove Byron Haywood. Gethin Jenkins has come in. We've looked a lot more solid, a lot more structured. Uh, we're pushing off. We're not as aggressive as perhaps we were under Sean Edwards, but we're managing side a lot better. And the last thing, he's picked Lewis Rees Amit. <laughs> Simple as that, <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> um, look, I thought that the England game against France was a good uh, was a good learning curve for the strengths and weaknesses of, of the French team, what you can and can't do against them. What what, what I've got my own thoughts. What, what are your thoughts out of, of that game and what Wales should be aware of both to exploit and to defend against. Yeah, I think, look, our kicking game needs to be spot on. Uh, I think, you know, both Chalibert has come in, hasn't he? When he's in the backfield, he's electric. Doolan has been fantastic, you know, in the air, dealing with kicks for such a diminutive guy uh, and his counter-attacking back. And then Dupont. So, you know, if kicking to France is going to give them any sort of go forward with Aldrit as well back there, again, across the halfway line, that's a danger sign for me. I think it's going to have to be a real intelligent thought process for Dan Bigger and co. and Stephen Jones this week as to how they're going to kick. Are they going to kick to compete and put France under pressure? Well, that's what uh, England or... did. I mean, England stopped this long ball game. And with pe- people like Dulan and whatever, you, you know how far they can kick anyway. And if you give Tom yeah. and other people room, you're going to be made to pay. So they, they, they cut that out completely. They made France battle for everything. You've got a few bubbles around there. And and I don't see any reason for for Wales to depart from that. Not least because Wales' game is not to kick the ball off the field anyway. Um, yeah, it has been and it has been since Warren Gatland. You know, keep, keep it on the field, keep a high ball in play time, and I think they'll probably stick with that and and put them under a bit of pressure. We, don't forget, we've got guys like Lewis Rees-Ahmed, jo- Josh Adams is back really to his best. George North at 13, who can compete in the air along with Dan Bigger. So that'll be a big thing and, and hope for a bit of a rub of the green. But, you know, it's hard to keep this French side down, isn't it? Teddy, Thomas, people like that, you know, DuPont. Ireland did well to sit on DuPont a lot. You know, England put the halfbacks under a bit of pressure. And and that has to be the recipe. But I'm a big one, Bright, you know, it, uh, that we have to go out and try and win it rather than try not to lose yeah. it. If we try not to lose this against France, they're too good, man. And, and I think as good as England were, I think both Scotland and France showed a little bit of having missed that previous round of the Six Nations. I think now France are battle-hardened. They were close to beating England. They come into this and we we steamrolled at a really poor Italian side and yet still didn't score in the last 15 minutes. So, there's, oh, there's so much added, isn't there? The, the, there is, but I thought that um, I thought what England showed in the second half is that, like every other team, you're susceptible to pressure. You make the little mistakes, you give away the penalties, you make the little knock-ons, and so on. Um, and I just wonder, Wales have had a, a, a proclivity ever since Warren Gatland took over, and it was still there under Wayne Pivak, uh, even in the early years. This tenacity to stay in games. And to stick with them, for me, the 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 it always is this way. By the way, but even more so, the ability to stay with Wales to stay physically with France up front, 
and possibly outmatch them in fitness terms, I think will go a long way to deciding this. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, that, that discipline that you mentioned has been so important to Six Nations. And it's modern rugby that we have to deal with. Wales have been so disciplined themselves that it's helped their cause. And, uh, you know, that has to be the factor against France as well. But you're right, matching them up front. And that resilience you talked about, Bray, comes from the core of experience that Wales have in the team. Ken Owens, Alwyn Jones, Falatau and Tiprick, Bigger, Jonathan Davis, and then Liam Williams. That core, that spine of being there, done that, really does add to the Welsh factor. And um, no crowd, which will be a, a big thing for Wales coming coming home to Principality Stadium. But, you know, have to deal with that and, and bring their own emotion. Um, money on a something else Grand Slam? Sorry? Money on a, a shit house Grand Slam. I don't know what. I don't care if it is a shite house uh, Grand Slam. <laughs> we'll take a Grand Slam any day, any year uh, in, in rugby. They're hard to get. You know that. Absolutely, mate. Thank you. Great to speak to you again. Take care, Sean. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Rob. Cheers, Sean. Rory, um, back to Italy. Look, a thumping loss against him. Frano Smith says it on an upward trajectory. And to, and to be honest, I think, actually, this crop of, of Italy players are probably as good as any they've seen at their stage of development. You know, they haven't got people to emerge yet. Because what they've got for me is at least an appreciation of how to play when the game breaks down. Whereas when they first came in, they were very much a set-piece side like Georgia, could do all the rote things, couldn't do anything else. That, to me, is a development. The problem is, obviously, everyone else is developing. And when I saw Georgia in the Autumn Nations Cup, I simply said, that is where Italy were when they joined the Six Nations. And I don't think they are any better than Italy. And I'm not sure they would win a playoff fixture. But I do agree that at some point, in some way, there has to be an automatic progression for Tier 2 teams into this tournament. Whether it's every two years, three years, whether it's by playing off home and away or whatever, that's for other people to decide and agree on. But I think there has to be something. But at the moment... What what do you think should be done with, with the Italy team? Yeah, I, th- I think you're right in that this group of players, you know, they're young, they need to learn the, the way they play. Everything you said is 100%. I think also with the coach, I think Franco Smith is one of the, the best coaches about in terms of being ahead of the game. You know, he kind of had these little plays. And I know that some of the stuff that we used with Ireland and Leinster used previously under Joe Schmidt, you know, some of those were stolen ideas from what Franco Schmidt was doing with Treviso and uh, and other sides. So there is an element of if it's going to happen that, that this is the group. There is the other element of Italy also. They don't lose to Georgia. I think they've played them in the last couple of times. They've beaten them reasonably comfortable both times. So replacing them with Georgia isn't going to make the Six Nations better. I do think when you look at the weekends, you kind of even last weekend, you know, the England France game was a great game. The Ireland Scotland game was a, a great game in terms of wanting to watch it, in terms of something at stake. And it felt like a tight game. It wasn't the same brand of rugby that England and France played, but it was gripping for a different reason. Whereas I think every round of games, it's almost feels like a bit of a, all right, okay, we'll watch this game at quarter past two just because we watch rugby and that's what we do. But there's nothing really that, that grabs you about it, which is bad for the Six Nations. But there is also, like, what else do you do? You either go back to Five Nations and, and you're in a better place to tell me how that rotated round and could it be more truncated and rest, have the rest weekends and player welfare? Like, I suppose I'm asking you, like, how did it go when it was Five Nations? You just had a, had a random weekend that you were off? No, no, it went straight through, generally. But you've got to yeah. remember, Rory. You know the the, the club games were nowhere near as in, intense, uh, you know, and so on and so on. And the reason they want to get it back and out of the way as quickly as possible is because people had jobs, so yeah. <laughs> you weren't working yeah. for five weeks. It was a bit of a hole in your pocket. So yeah, there is that aspect to it. I just still think, you know, for the ability for tier two European Northern Hemisphere nations to become self sufficient, they will never do that unless they're given an automatic right. However. It's done. However, whatever system is used uh, to get into the top table. Um, anyway, let's tell you what. Why don't we go to some questions? Because there are some good ones this week. I've got the first one. 
Um, are you a John Deere or a Matthew Ferguson man? And is it true that you and Sean O'Brien were passing brown pepper packages of tractors around in the Lions last Lions tour? <laughs> Uh, firstly, we don't. We're not John Deere or Matthew Ferguson. We have sent <laughs> sent them dudes for tractors. Although I have my own little Massey thirty five, a really old nineteen fifty eight, I think it is. So I I got it done up, and that's my little that's my little pet project. So John Deere Massey would have to be Massey Ferguson. And look, there's like there's in rugby context that there's always a few um, farmers kicking around, and Sean O'Brien. Um, is a unique character and there's really there's nothing would surprise you about him but you know you have the likes of tag furlong and uh, even dan lydiot is a big farmer um so it's always good to find rob carney believe it or not he's always <laughs> the one that, that i mentioned so it, it is true it is true it is true <laughs> tractor porn marvelous yeah <laughs> uh, we have a question um look england island games um have you got i've, I've got a i've got a good bed uh, it was an interesting memory I'll tell you it first, right? I was at Lansdowne Road, and uh, the Jesuit Bride, the, the iron flanker, he got hold of my foot, and I thought he was going to twist the ankle, and I thought that would be a really cynical, disgusting thing to do. And what he did was far more dis- he, he whipped my boot off, and he threw it into the crowd. <laughs> and the and referee didn't give you see this. He gave it a five-yard scrum. <laughs> And I'm there with Steve Smith, you know, 30 miles from Ballymena, north of Ireland, looking, seeing I haven't got a boot on, relishing it. You know, I'm saying, if I can't go down, I haven't got a, I haven't got a boot. And Smith is saying, get down, get down. I'm saying, wait a minute. He said, where is it? I said, it's in the crowd. So I had to go to the Lansdowne Road crowd and said, can I have my boot back, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And then someone said, say please. And I said, oh, f- f- what? So I said, <sighs> please. And he said, say pretty please. I said, I just lost it there. I said, oh, fuck off. Give me, give me a boot back. They threw it back on. And I finally put it back on. I don't imagine that's happened to you. But any uh, best and worst memories of a, of, a, you know, of a fixture, which you know, I know from, from, from an Irish point of view and certainly you know, laterally from an English point of view has, has assumed a huge significance because the sides have been so good. Yeah, there's been some great games, some really enjoyable games. I think when you go back, um, I can remember going to the 2000 game, the, the rearrange because of foot and mouth game. I think it was 2000, maybe 01. And um, I was at university in Newcastle upon Tyne at the time. So me and a couple of my English friends, we got drove down, got the boat across and went to the game. Of course, they were on the Grand Slam jolly. So when Ireland won that, that was a cracking weekend for me as a supporter. Uh, and then to play in some of these games, obviously the Grand Slam win in Twickenham was incredible and the way we played winning in Croke Park in 07 was enormous with the magnitude of, of what of the history around it there's been some not so good days sort of the early 2010 12 maybe then around 12 where we got a really wet day last round of six nations and we got wiped up front we got the scrum was just going backwards and regardless of the score we were well beaten anyway but you know yourself when you're in the middle of a scrum going backwards. Not fun, you know, you'd not rather fun the scrum go forward and lose the game sometimes. Um, and uh, that that was really hard to be to be physically beaten up front and then to lose the game. And it being a wet day, so there's a scrum. I felt like it was a scrum every two minutes. And it was horrible. Um, and then, obviously, that game, the Six Nations two years ago when, when England got the bonus point win in the Aviva, that was... For a team that were coming off the back of the 2018 year we had to then to lose that game in the manner we did was, was very disappointing. And I think that's the thing when, when you lose to England is generally as a forward, when you lose, you know you've been beaten up up front. Very rarely does one team get the ascendancy up front and lose the match. And, and that is very hard to take when you're a forward. Um, look, this is from Barry Phillips, but it could have been from any number of uh, of listeners and questioners, and it's about the scrum. And now, obviously, it's going to come down to this with me and you. In my day, there was a relatively straight feed, if not absolutely straight, and you had to hook. In your day, it got it went all over the place, didn't it? From from just pushing to to a strike to to to, to whatever. And now we seem to be get, getting back to a position where you're supposed to strike, um, and you're, you're supposed to feed the ball straight at a you know, albeit you can stand off to one side. And to me, it's just going again. Now, um, I, I, I have been vocal about this because I believe 
that striking mandates certain things. It mandates you, as a striking team, you want a st- stable scrum, first of all. So you're not the one that's buggering around and trying to move uh, and so on. I mean, and not, not least for me is they just take so long now you know, with the yeah. resets. What, if anything, do you think can and should be done? Um, look, I think obviously striking the ball should be something that was something that, that I was quite good at. Yes, I think it's were. a skill. And, you know, I think when you have a skill, you should be rewarded for being good at it and you should be penalised for not being good at it. And to feed the ball just negates that completely. I think that I feel they should probably be stopping the game clock for scrums because if you get to 78 minutes as a knock on, you might as well blow the whistle up. It's a bit like the end of an NFL game when the quarterback takes the knee. Yeah. You know, it's basically over unless you do something stupid. I think... There, there should be some way of let's not let the scrum constantly go down and reset. And whether it, it's just if there's any nonsense and penalties are quite severe. This is when the referee's guessing and it gives a penalty, like a penalty can cost you a match. You know, it, there's maybe a potential where you look at, you stop the game club. And if they go down, you just go, right, we're not messed around. It's the free kick. You can't re-scrum on the free kick. So you have to tap and off you go. Um, you just something like that because there is a lot of time wasted on it. But I also think it's a really fascinating area of the game. Well, certainly, you know, front row forwards find it fascinating. And rugby in its essence has a place for everyone. So if you're big, fast, slow, whatever it is, and if you make the scrum like rugby league, it becomes more of a game for athletes again. And and that takes away Well, you from... get to a stage where you could be six foot and 16 stone and play anyway. Yeah, exactly. And for being... For getting young kids into the game, the exclusive nature of it or the inclusive nature of it is what makes it great because kids, young kids play soccer. And if you're not fast and lighting your feet, you're no use. So you're you're the last pick, which is yep. as you as you sort of I'm sure you know when you're young and you're last picked, it's not a nice place what to be. Mean? What do you mean? How <laughs> <laughs> the good football? <laughs> wow. I'm I guess like... out. It's outrageous. Coming on to outrageous things, tag furlong. What about this? We can't have people. We can't have people doing this. We we just can't. It's embarrassing. I mean, it's just it was. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. It was great to watch, though, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and it's funny. Mike Ross tweeted on on Saturday or Sunday night, basically saying something that this this clip should never be shown again. <laughs> um, it's a tight head props nightmare to have other tight head props doing this. And in fairness to Ty, like he really came in and kind of reinvented what the Irish tight head prop is, you know, it was always before that it was John Hayes and Mike Ross. And it was about being big and strong and being able to scrummage. And all of a sudden this kid came came along and at the start, he got a few doings in the scrum, but he's now been able to scrum and scrum really well, but to do stuff around the pitch that back row forward, some back row forwards can't do. And, you know, it just is. And a lot of it with him is about his aggressive nature. You know, when he did that first step, the second step, you know, was almost, I'm not sure Finn Russell, I think Finn Russell bought it before he sold it. Oh, yeah, I'm um, pretty sure. He's... It was an easy way out. Oh, my God, he sidestepped me. He still <laughs> having to put his head across the front. And he still had the strength and the aggression to throw it off. But then the subtle pass afterwards, like, look, Tag Furlong has everything. And if you look at him and Kyle Sinclair, you know, they really are like the modern day tight heads, the sort of tight heads that from a Northern Hemisphere point of view, 10 years ago, you looked at the Southern Hemisphere and went, oh, how could you ever get props like that? And these boys have completely reinvented it. And look, it's great to see because they still have that stature and that physique and scrum is still important. But, you know, to be able to, to do that sort of stuff is class. Tell you what, uh, I will take a final one. Andrew Bromley. Uh, hello, chaps. A couple of nice words and memories about Gary Halpin. He was a bit of a hero of mine. And obviously, recently uh, passed away. Do you have any? I mean, I I didn't know Gary very well because he was after my time. And more, funnily enough, I used to meet in the pub m- much more often, um, you know, or in and around games. And I just thought he was a he was a mountain of a of a man. But I tell you what, as a quiet sort of self possessed guy, but with a very very wacky outlook on life, you know, he, 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 on on many things. And he, when you were around Gary. Things were never straightforward in in a, in, a, in a great sense of way. You never knew where things were going, and he he brought that unpredictability. And he was just a joy to be around because because he was he was different. Yeah, totally. And I think probably 
best summed up by the this try celebration that uh, was the 95 World Cup against New Zealand. You know, who goes New Zealand in a World Cup? You know, you have to be a little bit wacky to do that. And I think just the outpouring of, um, I didn't know him particularly well. Obviously, he was he was before my time, but like he would have been in Ireland teams that I would have watched as a supporter. But the outpouring of sort of some of the very recently retired players and right spanning back sort of generations of players that all had messages on social media and, and around the place sort of showed that big characters affect you and, and they touch people. And, and that's exactly what, what he's done. And, and everyone had such a great word to say for him. And, and it was a really, really sad moment for obviously his family, but for Irish rugby and probably the whole rugby fraternity. Rory, uh, great, mate. It's, um, it's great to speak to you at long last. And when we get the opportunity, we should have a beer. I can't promise you any tractor talk, but uh, <laughs> I, sh- I shall look up on other things. Thank you very much, Rory Best. Thank you, Brian. Well, that's all we have time for this week on Brian Moore's Full Contact with the Telegraph. A huge thank you to my co-host, Rory Best, and to Sean Hawley for joining me. And if you've enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe and check out some of our previous episodes? And you can do that by getting in touch at fullcontact at telegraph.co.uk. But if you need even more of an incentive for the next couple of weeks, you can enter a prize draw to win one of £300 John Lewis gift vouchers. If you just fill in our short survey, it'll ask uh, you what you enjoy about a podcast, what you'd like to hear more of, and you'll find the link in the episode description. It'll take less than five minutes. I'll be back next week to review... Well, it'll be the end, won't it, of the 2021 Six Nations. Enjoy the final weekend, Bar Scotland and France. Goodbye.